Good uh, morning, good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to this webinar on disaster risk uh, financing and social protection in Asia and Pacific. My name is Andrea Rossi. I'm the regional advisor for social policy economic analysis in UNICEF at the regional office um, for East Asia in uh, Bangkok. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, uh, the, the platform, the social the socialprotection.org and all the colleagues on the background, Paula in particular, for helping us in organizing uh, this webinar. Uh, this webinar is organized uh, by UNICEF in collaboration with WFP, the Red Cross, and is part of our partnership with the uh, Department for Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operation, ECHO, of uh, the European Union. And uh, I would like, in particular, uh, to give now the floor uh, to David Zappa, who is the senior expert on disaster risk reduction at uh, uh, the DG ECHO here at the regional office in uh, East Asia and Pacific for the opening remarks. Davide, um, you have the floor. Thank you, Andrea, and good afternoon from Bangkok to all of you colleagues. Thank you also for the opportunity to share some learning and reflection as available to the Director General for European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations, in short, DG ECHO, with you today. Our discussion happens at times of ever increasing global humanitarian needs. These are driven by conflict, population growth, fragility, and climate change. At the same time, the humanitarian funding base is not keeping up with demand. Better preparing for future risks where complex, multi layered hazards manifest, so to say, compound risk in the policy discourse, calls for action, which is urgent. Our Asia Pacific region is at the very center of some of the emerging metrics. This presents an unequivocal, powerful message. Investing in, preparing for, and to act early pays dividends. By helping in advance of a crisis, we know we can save lives, reduce needs, contribute to protect development gains, and thus reduce costs, meaning that humanitarian aid funds can spread wider. This is very encouraging, but we must collectively do more. This is why we have financed the work that has led to the publication of a disaster risk financing and social protection in East Asia and the Pacific, a comprehensive review of evidence on pre-arranged finance for government supporting disasters. We know that those who are most vulnerable and marginalized are often the least prepared. DG ECO's approach is always to put people at the center of what we do, leveraging investments we make to reinforce local preparedness and response capacity, whenever possible working at system level. We inform our policy based on lessons learned by implementing action through our partners with communities living in need and at risk. For those of you today who are our partners, let me profit of this occasion to remind that two of our policies are relevant in this discourse. The Disaster Preparedness Guidance published in 2021 and Cash Transfers published in March 2022. We are possible and appropriate. We support cash responses linked to existing social protection system to strengthen the resilience, lessen the impact of shocks, and facilitate the scaling up systems to respond to shocks and crises. This should be considered at all times, unless lack of legitimacy on the part of the government or de facto authorities will mean that it was in contravention of human principles. We are therefore looking forward to testing through the joint UN project, scaling up shock response and social protection to proactively manage risks before, during, and after the impacts of climate shocks and disaster in Eisen, how we can collectively contribute to the adaptation of shock responses systems and programs during periods of fragility, conflict, and, and or forced displacement so to better address and respond to the needs of crisis affected populations. Let me conclude this short remark, which in a productive discussion today, uh, reiterating that SRSP means adapting the design of SP social protection system to increase coverage, comprehensiveness, and or advocacy of assistance in response to shocks. Ultimately, strengthening resilience must be owned by states and governments and integrated within their own fiscal room. We are really looking forward to hearing your experiences in Asia Pacific today. Thank you again for giving us the, the opportunity to participate. And over back to you, Andrea. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Davide, and for, for the opening remarks. 
and definitely is, a, I would say, an exciting collaboration and area of work together. Um, what we were learning more and more is the fact we want to work on capacity of social protection system, not only to react uh, and mobilize funds after the events, but also all the machineries, all the uh, uh, equipment and uh, and tools that we have to develop before in order to make sure that the funds are, are uh, transferred. And I'm very happy about this collaboration. And I, I think it's important that this, this uh, uh, exercise, this analysis started, I would say more than a year ago, and we really used in multiple events uh, and in multiple discussion with the ASEAN, with ASEAN countries, with the different UN. And today is uh, not only a, a way to, uh, uh, to present uh, the work that has been done so far, uh, and of course, sharing the report with everybody who will be interested and is participating in this in this call. But more importantly, having really a discussion and a reflection, also hearing possibly from from participants on uh, all the new development uh, uh, on uh, on the relationship between disaster risk financing and social protection, and particularly on the thinking over the uh, uh, possibility to create uh, uh, new ways to mobilize funds. Um, for this purpose, uh, as you probably all know, you're all expert in Zoom, uh, there is a Q&A function button in, uh, uh, in your screen. And we will ask you please to use that button to propose question and to propose uh, and to have uh, uh, ideas and, and suggestions that we will use uh, later on uh, during the discussion. Really is more than a pre is presenting our, our work done so far and our thinking, understanding that probably in the meantime, new things are merged new experiences have been uh, implemented. And so we're really looking forward to, to hear uh, from, from each of you. So uh, today, uh, the, the, the webinar is, will be organized. Uh, we will have a uh, few key presentations from the lead uh, expert that was uh, working uh, uh, with us, uh, Cecilia Costella. And then uh, uh, we will hear from Katrina Safeti, who is a product program policy officer for the uh, uh, WFP in Pacific and specific example, and also uh, we'll try to present also the next step of the current work and collaboration that uh, we will do in these areas of work. And finally, we will open up uh, for discussion where we have a, a discussant uh, uh, with uh, with us. Uh, so uh, Daniel, who is a social protection and cash based transfer advisor for the WFP, will help us to to kick off the discussion and then open up to to each of you. But really, more than a presentation of work done is really uh, uh, an encouragement to hear more from all the participants of a new uh, development, new ideas, and ways to continue the work. Without uh, uh, that, uh, uh, also, I forgot, if you want, and this is remember, thanks to the colleagues in socialprotection.org, uh, there is also the possibility uh, to, uh, next slide, uh, please. Um, we can use uh, the Q&A box to the side and also use uh, the, uh, if you want to Twitter or if you want to exchange your comments, please do so. That would be great. So without further ado, I would like to introduce now and give the floor to Cecilia Costella, who will be, uh, who was the, and is our uh, lead expert on the study uh, to present the regional landscape analysis on disaster risk financing and shock responses, social protection, the key findings from the report. Over to you, Cecilia. Thank you very much, Andrea, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I want to say I, I was leading this work uh, that was done also in collaboration with uh, Mahan Farhat and Nick Travis uh, from OPM. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here today sharing with you. Next slide, please. So the objective of the work that we did was to assess the factors that enable or constrain the effectiveness of uh, risk financing mechanisms for shock response and social protection. Um, we focused on social assistance, especially on cash transfers, and uh, we looked at recent covariate uh, sort of large uh, shocks that affect everyone or multiple people. Um, in particular, um, we wanted to explore the lessons from the COVID, the responses to the COVID-19 shock and other uh, shocks uh, uh, between 2017 and 2020 in the region. Uh, I, um, I have to say, we didn't look at hum humanitarian financing flows. We looked at uh, funding through uh, government uh, systems and through sort of government-run social protection 
programs and systems. What we did was a regional landscape analysis, uh, looking at the majority of ASEAN countries um, and the way that they had um, uh, financed these uh, different shocks and how uh, what were the, the, the disaster risk financing instruments and mechanisms, the public finance mechanisms and how that funding had um, uh, been used through shock, shock responsive social protection. Uh, we did two in-depth country case studies from uh, Indonesia and Philippines. Uh, so the majority of the findings of this study come from these two countries. Um, so in some ways, some things that we present today might not be representative of the entire region. Next slide. Um, we... Um, Put together this framework to try to uh, assess the different uh, factors. So we wanted to look at financing, uh, including factors such as the source of funding, risk financing instruments, the policies and technical arrangements that govern those uh, uh, those instruments, including disaster risk financing strategies. But we also wanted to look at the flow of funds, so the channels through which the the, the funding actually flows, uh, which is the, the, the PFNs, PFM system, right? The, the system of checks, regulation, policies uh, that make the funding uh, reach its destination. And then we looked at the delivery, which um, in this case was uh, delivery through shock responsive social protection or through sh sh um, social protection systems. But delivery, of course, can be through multiple um, channels. Uh, as I said before, we did not look at humanitarian financing because normally this, this tends to, to run in a separate stream. Of course, all of this is uh, embedded in a policy and institutional environment that determines um, you know, to what extent these rules are followed, how what new rules are applied when disasters happen. So we also try to, to look at those factors. Next slide. Um, what we found in terms of the disaster risk finance uh, institutions and uh, uh, policies and strategies, and um, as Andrea mentioned, this was done about a year ago. So if there, there might be some things where you know you have some updates for us, and that would be great to to hear. Um, so countries have developed uh, a, an institutionalized disaster risk management management strategies, of course. Uh, but uh, mandates and, 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 and budgets create challenges to implement these strategies. Um, uh, this also leads, for, for instance, when, when there are multiple mandates and multiple budgets to implement these strategies, this can lead to duplications and overlaps when disasters happen. So, uh, for example, in I Indonesia, um, in addition to the disaster risk management agency, many line agencies have their own disaster response programs and their bu budget allocations. And of course, this can be efficient uh, to respond to disasters a bit more quickly, but it can also be a challenge in terms of uh, coordinating and, and duplicating overlaps. Um, in general, disaster risk financing is at an earlier stage. Uh, Indonesia and Philippines are the only two countries that at that time had uh, a disaster risk financing strategy in place. And these strategies don't have uh, or didn't have a specific links to shock responsive social protection. Um, except for the Philippines, uh, we didn't find any country that had done a significant extensive risk analysis in order to, you know, to plan either the disaster financing strategies or uh, the disaster plans, uh, disaster funding plans, sorry. Um, there are no pre-agreed funding release thresholds or, or triggers um, in any of these strategies. So uh, it, this means that the release of funding continues to be pretty much ad hoc in most cases. And even in the cases where there are some uh, more institutionalized uh, mechanisms, there aren't any sort of plans to implement this on an annual basis, which you know might need to be put in place um, to actually uh, put this in practice. There is, however, a lot of interest in the region on disaster risk financing. Uh, there is uh, the Sea Drift Initiative, uh, which at the time was uh, just being launched. Um, um, Indonesia and Philippines are both innovated in terms of uh, disaster risk financing strategies 
um, and, and using them, for instance, in the case of Indonesia to reform their PFM system. So as a way to put in place rules and, and, and arrangements for the flow of funds. Um, and in the Philippines, uh, uh, the same, a very interesting innovation is that uh, local local governments and, and local officials are starting to also um, develop their own disaster risk financing strategies based on the country's uh, strategy. Next slide. Um, the in terms of funding sources and instruments, uh, there there are differences across the, the the countries, of course. And the Philippines has the most comprehensive system in terms of. Um, having a, a, a set of instruments uh, to try to, to to deal with disasters. Uh, so, for instance, they do have in place uh, risk retention instruments, which are uh, instruments within you know the government budget that uh, can take care of, of the perhaps the the uh, not so <laughs> the the less um, impactful uh, aspects of a disaster. So when is when it's smaller scale, or or you know that when the when the needs are, um, are rapid at the beginning, but they also have uh, access to disaster um, uh, insurance uh, and other sort of contingency mechanisms, and they have used them in the past. Uh, there's been payouts, and, and they've been able to transfer these risks to international markets. Um, but overall, most countries in the regions rely on this risk retention instrument. So. Um, you know, budgetary reserves mechanisms and um, contingency loans, and of course, exposed instruments uh, like post disaster credit, supplementary budgets, uh, essentially just reallocating funds from internal budgets. And the main source of disaster response uh, continues to be domestic finance. Um, Countries uh, are exploring the use of uh, risk transfer mechanisms, as I said, like the CDRIF, for instance, but this effort seem, seem very early uh, in most countries. And um, the ex ante disaster risk financing arrangement uh, that are in place do not necessarily provide enough fiscal capacity to deal with the cost of disasters when they happen. This means the reserves are not sufficient to cover the cost of disasters. Um, so what happens is that when there are not enough reserves, uh, when disasters happen, then this is met with reallocations. And this is why these mechanisms are used uh, so commonly. Next, please. Um, in the use of prearranged uh, PFM, public finance management regulations, uh, can of course uh, have a, a very important influence on the timeliness, timeliness of financing. Uh, so for instance, the, Philippi the Philippines has a quick response fund, um, which uh, has a pre-approved uh, schedule of allocations to different departments, including the Department of Social Welfare and Development, that is the department that uh, implements uh, a lot of the social assistance programs. And so this, uh, this emergency allocations uh, can be distributed within weeks. Uh, without having to uh, uh, resort to other sort of budget reallocations. Of course, they tend to be smaller. Um, and there, there is a degree of flexibility um, of PFN arrangements um, in countries that vary, vary considerably. So in some countries like in Laos, PDR, there's no budget reallocations are possible uh, following disasters based on rules. And on the other hand, uh, some countries, for instance, like the QRF uh, in the Philippines have very broad uh, uh, spending sort of uh, possibilities. And sometimes this leads to different interpretations. So there's a lot of variation. Um, and the thing is when the PFM rules are not aligned with institutional and programmatic arrangements, this hinders implementation. So um, for, for instance, in Indonesia, resources from the disaster fund can only be dispersed through the disaster risk management agency and cannot be challenged through other government agencies. For instance, to top up uh, the budget of the social protection agency and the Ministry of Social Affairs. Uh, so that's why these agencies need to uh, allocate their own funding for disaster response. Um, and another very important finding was the expenditure 
controls versus speed of disbursement is a big issue. Uh, so, of course, there is a need to track and, and have controls on the money that is spent. At the same time, this leads to, you know, um, uh, slower disbursements, which in the end might mean that uh, funder, funding, funding is not utilized. So the, there is funding available, but it cannot be utilized because there are so many rules or so or the rules are so strict that it is difficult to allocate that funding. But interestingly, the use of the funds uh, when they are used is quite difficult to track and there is a, a, a lack of transparency. So there is a lot of rules to enable that funding to flow, but then it's all, when it does flow, it's difficult to track where it went and to sort of uh, uh, account for it. Next slide. Um, so in, in terms of the delivery mechanism, shock response of social protection, before COVID-19, most countries in ASEAN had very little experience with you know, responding to large shocks through uh, social protection, in part because systems are nascent in this region, in social protection systems, that is. Um, you know, they tend to have low coverage and weak information um, management systems. Uh, and there is not a lot of integration with, for instance, disaster risk and, and, and beneficiary data. So it's very, it's, it's difficult to use them for disaster response. Um, there are, or there were not at the time, uh, any social protection programs linked to protocols for early action uh, or for um, anticipatory action, um, except, you know, to that extent that some social, as, um, social assistance or social welfare agencies are part of the disaster risk management coordination mechanisms. Um, so even in the countries that do have prearranged financing, uh, the uh, you know the delays in the response uh, seem to occur mostly because of a uh, capacity of the social protection system uh, and because of its design. Uh, so in Indonesia, for instance, the response to the Lombok earthquake in 2018 and the Sulawesi uh, uh, earthquake and tsunami, it took very long in part due to like very lengthy. Uh, uh, beneficiary identification and ver verification processes. Um, so it was not so much an issue of funding, but an issue of uh, the, the verification of, of enrollment and targeting. Um, so while the social protection response was, of course, a lot more significant, uh, there, was, there were still challenges. Um, you know, some programs like in Indonesia, for instance, the the program was not allowed uh, by the, the rules of the program to expand beyond a certain number of beneficiaries. And that led to uh, the need to put in place a new program, which is not necessarily you know, a bad thing, but it could, it could take a bit more time. Um, and, um, and of course, there, is no, there were no links to, or there were very little links to the uh, PFN mechanisms because a lot of, um, a lot of the responses were, uh, you know, done based on ad, ad hoc uh, rules uh, that were put in place because of the, the nature of COVID. Um, next slide, please. So just very briefly to mention a few uh, factors sort of based on everything I've just presented to you uh, now. I think the nature of the scale uh, and the nature and scale of the shock are are very important for mobilizing financing and delivering in a timely, timely manner. I think we've seen this with COVID, you know, which was a very large shock and the responses were large and, and, and rapid in many cases. But of course, uh, COVID is very different or was very different to, uh, the, to the type of shocks that the region faces on a much more regular basis. basis. So, you know, uh, natural hazard related shocks, which both large and small, which uh, occur uh, frequently. And uh, so the political imperative to mobilize funding for these large, for sorry, for these smaller shocks might be more, um, you know, more difficult to find. So this influence funding and, 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 and the flow of funds as well, because in the case of COVID, of course, many rules were lifted to enable uh, this funding to flow very quickly. Um, 
So the other thing to notice is that while well, finding it, having the funding and having the funds available before the shop happens is very important, having the prearranged mechanisms to deliver that funding is very important. Um, this prearranged part, this like putting in place all these rules and putting in place the systems to deliver this funding uh, is a very significant challenge. So when we focus on you know, disaster risk financing, we also need to consider this system needs beyond uh, beyond just the sources of funding, right? Um, uh, so, and I guess on the same notes, you know, the availability of financing is of course necessary, but it's not a sufficient measure to enable a social protection system to be shock responsive uh, because of the need to have the systems in place. Next slide. Um, in terms of disaster risk financing, uh, Obviously, disaster risk management legislation that includes financing. A lot of the disaster risk management legislation does not actually include uh, uh, provisions for funding. Um, it's very important, and of course, it, it's preferable to have a disaster risk finance, financing strategy uh, where, where there are pre allocated budgets or funds. So it's important to be specific enough so that the, there isn't uh, a lot of sort of uh, questions when. When a disaster happens as to you know how, how do we make these funds flow um but it's also important to keep in mind that multiple sources of finance are needed because shocks uh, occur at different scales um so you don't always need to resort to for instance disaster risk financing uh, sorry um insurance or uh, um, international uh, insurance um, but sometimes, you know, some of the, the, the prearranged uh, budgetary reserves can, can, can be enough. So having, when we, when we think about the sources of funding, it's important to think about sources of funding across these instruments and not just focus on one particular instrument. Um, so, um, and the, the last point here is that availability and flexibility of risk transfer financing instruments um, uh, that cover high severity, low probability uh, risk uh, is important. So countries rely on, on risk retention instruments, even for very la large scale disasters. Um, so partly because this, this market-based risk transfer instruments have not been established, but also because they're, they can be very specific, so they can cover just one particular risk, and um, and and you know the shock you get hit by is a different one, and you still don't have that availability of of large financing from from prearranged market based uh, insurance. Um, next slide. I think I'm. Uh, this is just a, a couple of more slides, and I'm, I'm done. So uh, the key factors for uh, PFM, uh, public finance management, of course, use of prearranged PFM processes uh, to manage disaster expenditure. So mean, this means putting in place these mechanisms before disasters happen um, to enable uh, the flow of funds rapidly in anticipation or in response of disasters. Um, but then, of course, a, a strong government coordination is needed uh, across levels and agencies that is aligned with those financing flows and that includes enough devolution of the PFM and delivery arrangements um, to the local level so that they can make decisions at that level. Um, and a strong PFM system, including um, a careful balance between the ability to use budgets flexibly, but also to track and report disaster expenditures is uh, very important because it on one hand, it can avoid the underutilization of funds, but also increase the transparency and the acceptability of this spending during the shocks, right? Especially through social protection. And, and finally, next slide. Um, uh, the, in terms of key factors for shock responsive social protection, uh, strong systems uh, with shock responsive mechanisms in place, integrated within overarching social protection systems is key. Uh, and then also a balance between some of the rigorous controls uh, in terms of targeting and fiduciary concerns that social protection programs and systems tend to have on a regular basis with the flexibility that is needed in disasters. So what we saw in COVID is that, uh, in the response to COVID is that 
a lot of countries kind of lifted a lot of the rules, uh, you know, not only for funding, but also for targeting, for registration. There was a lot more acceptance of, you know, some errors just in the name of speed. And that doesn't tend to happen as often with other uh, disasters that are smaller or that are, you know, more localized. Um, disaster risk financing policies, the strategies and plan that are linked to social protection that's missing and that needs, you know, they need to integrate ways of spending funds through social protection. Um, and of course, uh, when we talk about social protection systems, we talk about re updated registries, information systems and payment systems. Um, but and also finally, uh, access to the, this funding by local governments implementing social protection responses. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to the discussion and any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia, uh, for a very comprehensive presentation. And uh, I already see that uh, that's good that uh, some of you start using the Q&A uh, option to start uh, uh, shooting some questions. So what we will do during the presentation, uh, we'll ask uh, uh, eventually Cecilia if you can answer some of them in the chat in the Q&A, but we will also take some of them at the end for the Q&A discussion. So thanks again, uh, Cecilia. And uh, I will line out to give the floor uh, to Katerina <coughs> from uh, uh, the WFP. Uh, Katrina, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, participants. I'll uh, just do a quick... So the presentation today is um, generally in the Climate Risk Insurance Pilot uh, for Social Welfare Recipients um, in Fiji. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so Fiji generally, um, as with the rest of the Pacific, faces a uh, high climate and disaster risk um, exposure. Um, and according to the IPCC um, report of 2021, um, this risk exposure is expected to increase as a result of, of climate change. Um, and the COVID-19 in um, 2020 um, also undermined um, and sort of added to, to um, the vulnerabilities um, of climate change and disasters um, and undermined these vulnerable um, households in Fiji, specifically their um, resilience, um, ensuring that they resorted to increased stress, crisis, and emergency level uh, coping strategies to meet their their basic needs. Um, and this specific um, data um, is based on the WFP uh, mobile vulnerability analysis and, and mapping monitoring that was conducted uh, in Fiji and across um, four other Pacific Island countries. Um, so the climate risk um, insurance product is, um, is a market-based safety net against um, extreme weather events um, that enables uh, rapid payments. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the, this particular um, pilot in Fiji is based on a predetermined uh, triggering event, uh, for example, a, a tropical cyclone, um, which means that you'd have uh, flooding and high wind speeds or a drought, for example, where you'd have um, low instances of rainfall. Um, and it's also based on um, some objective parameters. Um, for example, um, if you take um, a tropical cyclone, you're looking at uh, distance to the eye of the cyclone um, or the wind speed, or the category of the cyclone. Um, the other point is that um, this particular um, insurance product uh, does not need uh, an assessment um, as payout is uh, independent from the losses. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there's a rapid uh, cash payout uh, based on the uh, predetermined uh, thresholds, um, and that would be discussed later in the, in the slides coming up. Um, and this is uh, generally three to five days, within three to five days. 
Um, it also enables uh, insurance providers to offer products um, at a lower premium. It covers uh, perils that were previously considered um, uninsurable. Um, it encourages uh, proper DRM practices. We're looking at investing um, in climate risk insurance um, as a form of um, DRR and, um, and when accompanied with uh, some disaster risk management mes um, messages uh, to um, at-risk populations can also help to protect, uh, help them protect their assets and, and their livelihoods um, ahead of shocks. Um, these uh, the parameters and payouts are based on, on data received or retrieved from um, an independent uh, third party. Um, particularly, we're looking at um, specific MAT offices um, and, and sort of technical, uh, climate technical um, modeling partners. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Um, just a short uh, background, an overview of um, the initial uh, pilot. Um, so this pilot um, was launched in November of 2021 um, and is really a partnership between uh, WFP in the Pacific and um, the UN Capital Development Fund, UNCDF, um, and partnering with uh, the Department of Social Welfare in Fiji. Um, which is under the Ministry of, of Women, Children and uh, Poverty Alleviation um, to pilot a first of its kind uh, social protection climate risk uh, insurance product for 274 social welfare recipients um, located in identified disaster prone locations um, in the central and, and western divisions of PG. Um, the Specific geographic locations um, were determined um, generally because uh, at, at the time that this uh, insurance pilot was um, being launched um, and rollout uh, was really during the, the COVID lockdown period in Fiji. There was a focus um, in the central and western divisions because these were the, the lockdown areas. Um, and, and also there were uh, restrictions in travel uh, so generally, a lot of the work really was done uh, remotely um, to sort of get this, this pilot off the ground. Um, and the pilot really builds off um, UNCDF's experience um, in, in work in the Pacific, particularly with pharma cooperatives under their uh, PCAP partnership, which is the Pacific Insurance and um, Climate Adaptation Pro uh, Program. Um, um, WFP with, it, with, with its partners um, really saw uh, an opportunity to bring this down to, to the next level in terms of targeting highly vulnerable individuals and households um, under the, the Department of Social, uh, Social Welfare Schemes. Um, these particular schemes um, really include uh, social pension, uh, disability allowance, um, care and protection, um, and uh, the poverty benefit scheme. Um, and um, really looking at um, populations that were already more vulnerable um, than the general uh, population in terms of their sort of recovery um, from disasters and coupled with um, the impact of COVID. Um, which uh, really saw uh, WFP support, I think, uh, prior to this pilot in terms of uh, supporting a one-time um, top-up for, for DSW recipients um, in response to Tropical Cyclone Herald in, in 2020. Um, so this was uh, another aspect which um, I think supported that opportunity to uh, work with uh, social welfare, the Department of Social Welfare. Um, next slide, please. So this is generally um, an, an overview of, of what the, the insurance uh, product um, really did, did cover. So the initial product um, <clears throat> was really a, um, a heavy wind cover only, um, where pay, payment um, 
um, would happen once the threshold of, of wind speed is reached or exceeded. Um, so this is based um, according to the various categories of the of the cyclone. Um, as you can see that the um, category one is, is not covered in the first initial product. Um, and payout is based on the highest gust wind speed during the event. Um, and the maximum events within one policy year are covered up to um, a maximum of 100% uh, for the sum insured, which is, um, which is 400. Um, and, and generally, um, also across uh, the parameters uh, in terms of the distance uh, to the eye of the cyclone um, in kilometers. Um, so the pay payment uh, values um, generally um, correlate to, to these parameters as seen in, in the graph, um, in the table um, on screen. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, so the general recipient onboarding process, um, because we were working um, with Department of, of Social Welfare um, and as well as the Ministry um, and with our partner UNCDF, um, and generally in terms of the, the payments, we also um, worked with um, within the private sector. So uh, bringing on board um, an, in, the, an insurer who would be uh, providing these, these payouts directly to the Ministry um, of Women who would then distribute this to their um, uh, particular um, recipients who were part of the part of the pilot. Um, so, so WFP um, and UNCDF really um, their particular uh, support in terms of um, the on onboarding um, process for recipients was really in a technical capacity support um, sort of um, um, area. Um, rather than uh, direct um, sort of handling of, of recipient data. Um, and so that first, I think, support um, provided was in terms of identifying high-risk areas based on um, historical cyclonic information. So not only working, um, I think, in partnership with, with the Department of Social Welfare, but, but more so with um, a climate modeling partner um, who were um, contracted through through the UNCDF um, partnership, um, as well as with um, the Met offices, uh, particularly in Fiji. Um, once these areas were identified, um, that request was sent to the Department of Social Welfare um, to look at identifying uh, particular um, their select recipients under the four schemes um, and, and providing sort of that data uh, listing to, to the insurance uh, company. Um, um, that fourth point, which includes the call center and consent for interested persons. Now, um, this particular uh, component of the onboarding process, um, so the call center used was um, a contracted service provider under WFP's um, mobile um, vulnerability analysis um, mapping um, unit in, in Fiji. So um, we use that specific call center um, to then contact uh, select DSW beneficiaries um, and also seek their uh, to, con to seek their consent um, as to whether they would like to be uh, part of the pilot or not. Um, and once this was um, then completed, um, those particular uh, recipient data was provided to to the insurer uh, for onboarding. And and this process, I think the last process was specifically between the, the DSW, so the Department of Social Welfare and, and the insurer. Um, so once that, that information, um, all information was validated um, and consent received from um, recipients. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so this is um, this is is just uh, a spotlight um, that was developed um, by by the multi country office um, on on the general um, um, sort of uh, specific activities um, in the coverage. Um, as well as the geographic locations of the initial pilot. Um, it also provides, I think, on the top um, left of the screen, it provides the, the different um, DSW schemes. It, it also provides the, the number of recipients that, that were um, onboarded. Um, it also provides um, some disaggregated data ac um, across um, gender. Um, and um, and also the type of um, sort of um, how how the payment I think was uh, provided to these particular recipients. Um, I think one one of the key things to note in terms of the first initial pilot uh, rollout were um, the particular challenges in terms of um, the digital sort of wallets as, as well as um, sort of how beneficiaries um, or recipients were to receive their payments. Um, and a particular challenge uh, for those who were or requested to, to use digital wallets. Um, and this meant using their phones um, um, and mobile wallets to receive, uh, to receive funds. Um, that challenge was particularly um, sort of keeping their numbers um, and ensuring that these numbers uh, were validated and verified according to the specific, uh, to, to the, the, the various recipients um, over time. Um, next slide, please. Katarina, if you can sum up yeah. in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so the first um, the, the first pilot lessons learned um, one is that uh, we don't have any any sort of proof of concept um, at the moment, uh, basically because there was no trigger event, so no cyclone happened um, for us to to monitor whether this uh, you know challenges and lessons learned. Um, what we did know is that the initial product was received well not only by government but also by uh, recipients. Um, there were some challenges with ob obtaining uh, informed consent, particularly around um, um, the phone numbers of, of various recipients um, and, and validating and verifying this. Um, the fourth was um, the COVID restrictions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, is that we were rolling out uh, and launching this product during the height of COVID and, and uh, travel restrictions uh, were in place. Um, and last uh, was a need to enhance uh, product features and in, in the benefit uh, structure. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this basically um, UNCDF supported uh, by its technical partner, uh, which is a climate modeling firm um, out of India, WRMS. Uh, worked on enhancing the product features um, and benefit structure with a view to, to offer a better value proposition to, to the welfare uh, recipients. Um, and uh, further discussions in early, of early 2022 looked at uh, proposing to move from the initial pilot to a limited scale by covering um, uh, 2000 beneficiaries. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this just generally gives an overview of the coverage period um, and the risk risk perils um, covered. Um, so moving from the first initial product, which only covered um, high wind speeds, we're looking at a scale-up product um, to cover not only wind, but rainfall um, um, as well. And our coverage duration generally would be covered um, over the cyclonic season um, in the Pacific which is generally um, November to, to April, but we're covering the coverage duration generally from September of 2022 to September 23 and the risk duration um, over October 2022 to uh, September 2023. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so this um, generally gives a, a, an overview of, of the new scale-up product that we developed um, with um, UNCDF um, and, and in sort of partnership with, with DSW, as well as the climate modeling partner. So um, what we've seen here is that um, the differences is um, there's an increased um, sort of payment um, um, across the recipients. One, because we've added um, category one, which was not uh, category one cyclone, which was not um, included in the, in the initial uh, pilot product. Um, so it has a combined wind and rainfall cover. Um, that's again, based on a pre predefined index. Um, it covers a category one. Um, and it also has a rainfall pay, uh, payout, uh, which is uh, payable irrespective of the wind uh, wind payout um, and um, multi multiple events within one policy year are covered up to a maximum of 100% um, of the sum insured. Um, the cover pay, payout uh, within a week um, once the above thresholds or, or for wind speed and or rainfall are met or exceeded. Um, and the payouts again are based on the highest gun, uh, gusts of wind speed and or recorded rainfall during the event. Um, so as you can see, for a Category 3 event um, at 25 to 50 ki uh, kilometers, the payout for wind um, event would be $60. Um, and assuming a rainfall in the range of uh, 250 to 300 millimeters um, over three days, um, an add-on value um, of $120 uh, will be added. So the, the total pay payout to a recipient um, would be 150 um, over that three to, to five days. Um, so this just gives um, sort of a comparison between the old, the, the initial um, product um, and um, the new product that, that we're offering in terms of the wind speed category. Um, so the enhancements that we've made to to the product is that um, I think I mentioned earlier, which is the including of the inclusion of category one um, and beneficiaries within that 25 km radius from the eye of the storm, um, increasing the payout amounts um, for many of the steps, providing beneficiaries this um, sort of additional uh, protection. Um, the premium will be re retained um, at the same level, looking at $32 per participant. Um, the cyclonic storm or, or wind speed scale uh, modified to, to widen the coverage and consequently providing a, a possibility of, of payout, payouts. Um, and the fifth additional product option two, um, which is the new scale up uh, product um, has wind and excess rainfall cover combined um, at the same premium. Um, so this is, this is the last slide, I'm gonna be quick. Um, so we're looking at the next steps um, over the next year, uh, which would be upscaling the beneficiaries from the initial 274 and looking at um, 2,000 um, recipients, um, scaling up coverage um, and of future uh, fund funding uh, opportunities. And um, we have been in discussions with uh, the Fiji government um, and as of a couple of months ago, we have received some, um, some um, really good news that the, the Fiji government will be providing um, the payment or the premium payments uh, for this next scale-up product of, of 2,000 beneficiaries. Um, the initial uh, premium pay payment was provided uh, by WFP. Um, so currently involved in um, the third point is current. We're currently involved in improving the uh, management inf information systems for um, existing national social protection um, um, systems, um, and this is really um, in in strong partnership with with the Ministry of Women 
um, as well as the Department of Social Welfare. So we really are, are working across the national uh, as well as uh, sub-national level um, in Fiji to, to upgrade this, uh, this MI, MIS system, uh, as well as to automate their, their, um, their assessment forms um, and have that sort of all online. Um, at the moment, I think the challenges are um, a lot of this is uh, paper-based and um, stored on Excel sheets. So we, we really are looking to, to uh, support the government uh, in this area. Um, the, the fourth is the monitoring and evaluation for, for proof of concept. Um, because we really didn't have um, a major tropical cyclone event over the past year, so we really could um, did not have the opportunity to um, to test out uh, the the product. Uh, but we we are going ahead um, with the with the scale up with the support of of government, and I think it is important to note um, in terms of this particular product um, is that uh, we are looking to uh, support future pro uh, products that can be modified for, for multiple installments um, uh, that are post uh, catastrophic, catastrophic um, event based um, on, on the trigger. Um, and this is particularly to be decided by, by the Department of Social Welfare. Um, yeah, um, I think that's, um, that's, that's, that's it from, from my end, um, Andrea. Thank you so much, Katrina, to go uh, through all the presentational the details. And, yeah. and in a way, we really hope that you will never have the possibility to test it. <laughs> yes, this is what I also we do, but uh, no, that was, uh, was a very good one. And thanks to everybody for um, all the questions that I can see in the Q&A. Uh, and remember, that you can vote the question. So if I, the first question will be the one that we will start answering. And I, I've seen Cecilia do a fantastic job answer those questions and also we'd ask uh, uh, Katrina also to, to start looking at all your questions so we can uh, reply during this, uh, this part. I will ask to, to go on the on next, next part of the, uh, of the discussion is really to look at uh, ahead. So we would like to, to have a quick uh, uh, um, thinking over what we can, uh, uh, what we can do, uh, next one on uh, linking disaster risk financing and social protection, how, how we can strengthen the work. And definitely there are five areas that I think is important that we, we look at. Uh, as, uh, as the beginning also, as Cecilia was mentioning, one is something uh, that we have learned through the COVID and we're learning through all different emergency is that the importance of strengthening core social protection mechanism. We have seen that when, when we have a, a strong social protection mechanism that is well-designed, then is able to respond to the shock, then is able also to incorporate and uh, to absorb the financing. Because again, it sounds obvious, but if we work on the financing procedures and then the social protection system is not able to challenge the funds at the right moment to the right people, then time financing this course is irrelevant. Well, once we have a social protection system that is uh, strong and is able to respond to shocks, then we need to work on the public finance component. And, and here there is a lot of things to do because the different processes that uh, uh, need to be put in place uh, and the, the mechanism needs to be uh, uh, well done and designed. There are multiple ways, multiple bottlenecks where actually uh, the funds cannot, cannot go through. The second one is how we design the uh, the requirements and here we we, we have we have listened and we, we are learning more and more about the importance of risk analytics and this is something that in the past in social protection uh, systems was not part of the kind of uh, uh, core activity you know we have the IMS IMS we have the targeting we have different components but the risk analytics was not that and then expanding the role of non traditional stakeholders uh, in disaster risk financing and uh, and here probably is the area that we have to work more and more, particularly understanding and knowing that in the future, or we're already in a situation where uh, from one side, we, we increase the needs, and on the other side, we see that decrease in the resources for multiple reasons. But we know that social production in many cases is counter-cyclical. Uh, that means we have more resources when there is less need and vice versa. And then I had a discussion about how we can reduce the size of the risk of be transferred. And here is what is the way that social protection can work on that. So let's go in, in some of the details. Next one. So um, in, in terms of the integration, I think there is a lot of work that we have to do at different level 
to uh, um, to integrate the financial systems together with uh, uh, the social protection one. Um, and here is that the fact that social protection has to include a, a disaster component, as well as the disaster mechanism should be linked and coordinated and integrated with the possibility to, to transfer cash through the system is a critical aspect. In many areas, in many countries, these two components are already separated and they are not working together. We, we, we have sometimes a problem of um, flags in the sense that, you know, uh, uh, if it's something labeled as social protection goes through one minister, is it labeled as emergency or climate change or shock responsive or natural disaster goes through a different uh, uh, institution and ministry? And that is a critical component. So we really need to integrate the three parts, the social protection component, the disaster component, and the public finance component. And again, not always people working in these three areas speak the same language. They may have the same uh, objective and the same interest, but they don't speak the same, the same language. And here is the importance of, of the integration. In that sense, the support and the work, uh, for example, of the UN and other agencies can be, hopefully, uh, uh, one of the opportunity to link together different players that not necessarily at the country level work together. But the critical one, probably the most important one, is this idea to move from ad hoc intervention to system models. So the idea is that from the DRF, so from, from the disaster risk financing, that in a way is an ad hoc kind of uh, intervention, we can develop a system that is able to, not automatically, but is able to manage the risk that a country is facing in a more constructive and coordinated way. And uh, the other part in terms of the integration, I, I think, is, is, is critical that we know that uh, we are in a situation where we had a huge expansion of the social protection, the capacity of social protection systems to respond to a shock because of COVID, who was a unique shock, the shock that actually uh, 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 touched everybody, not just few people. We know that we are in a situation of consolidation, of fiscal consolidation. That means that the resources that are being mobilized for, uh, for COVID are not the same resources that we will have forever. So they are going down. Well, the critical aspect is that we have to make sure that the systems learn from the experience of COVID, that was a unique shock, to, uh, uh, to look at in a, a, a system capacity response to any kind of shock. Again, the COVID was exceptional. We really hope it was exceptional. But what is not exceptional is the fact that we are entering a period where shocks are becoming more and more relevant and more and more frequent. Uh, just mentioning the climate change will be one, as well as other um, kind of uh, economic shocks such as man-made and conflict and et cetera. Next one. So the second part in terms of the work ahead and, and in terms of where we really need to work uh, with the governments and together is the, and, and, and Cecilia was mentioning as, as a part of the evidence in, in the report, is that still we need to improve the flow of funds and, and, and the, the, the PFM disaster arrangement. This is a critical one. So is not only the allocation of funds, but making sure that the funds, when the funds are made available, are able to move in the right way and to the right people. What happened is that we know that in the past, and this was a major situation in COVID, the major way to identify funds were budget revisions. Uh, we, we do work on public finance. We analyze the, all the analysis that we have done on, on social protection in terms of when we is based on budget allocation in a way are not providing the real uh, picture of what was later on the disbursement of funds in social protection because a lot of budget revision, a lot of adjustment have been done in the last year. Almost every year, every six months, there were different kind of adjustment. So it's even difficult within the um, uh, the, the work in, in monitoring and, and following the money to use the, the traditional instruments. But that's a, that's a critical one. And then, of course, uh, the idea of alternative sources of financing is uh, uh, an important one. Uh, in terms of uh, different options, uh, not only in terms of uh, uh, risk retention, but also in terms of combination of different uh, uh, modalities. Um, we want to have, uh, from one side, there are still space to increase the tax base uh, uh, and the, the non-contributory component, as well as develop an instrument linked with the contributory component or the insurance component that can be uh, effective. Again, is an area where there have been tested and pilots, 
But what is important is that we, we, we use a system approach. So developing and designing solution that should go on scale maybe can allow us to, uh, uh, to develop a better one. In terms of uh, uh, the financing, the efficiency and transparency of risk ret retention instruments are, are, are critical. Uh, and again, let's go also in the in the uh, experience of COVID, the other uh, the other shocks. Sometimes the emergency component uh, allows, I'm going to say, uh, reduce the the, the normal uh, check and balance, or at least may reduce the way that we can look at efficiency and transparency. Uh, and this is something we should uh, we should not underestimate. Also. The importance of, of, of uh, uh, creating uh, uh, proper uh, evidence on what's happening is a, is a critical one. The, the lesson learned from all the shocks, not just the COVID, but definitely all the shocks, is that the last mile, so what happened at the last mile is the most important uh, aspect. And that means the engagement of local authority levels is critical in all the aspects, in the aspect that is related to the, uh, uh, to the emergency response, to the aspect that is related to the, um, the, the, the disbursement of money, but also in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the aspect of managing the resources, the financial resources that might reach the local level, that not necessarily the local level is able to, to handle. Next one. And then finally, uh, the the kind of the response here, I think uh, more and work should do and should you know really working together with different minister of uh, social welfare in charge of social protection, is on uh, 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 the capacity to do risk analytics uh, around these and uh, around disasters at a larger scale. Risk analytics should be part of the work within the ministry in charge of social protection, not just in the ministry in charge of emergency response. Um, the the uh, second component of the response we heard from the case of uh, of uh, Fiji, the the trigger design, how and when the action will be implemented, is is uh, critical, and this is why need to be uh, developed on uh, very specific and timely data. We were here about millimeter of waters and and different uh, 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 different kind of aspect, but here is what really can also solve the problem of reaching all the people or discrimination within, uh, within the system. So we can use that capacity of uh, um, DRF mechanism to look at, uh, at objective information rather than uh, uh, a more kind of uh, ad hoc assessment to identify the trigger design. At the same time, we know that in some situations, some information can create exclusions for the simple fact that maybe in an area, the capacity of the of uh, collecting information is different from the other one. So we also, in that sense, bring in the experience that we have in social protection in terms of exclusion error and what can generate exclusion error or what sometimes a very complicated system of uh, data collection can uh, in, uh, increase the discrimination is an important one. Um, the, the, the other part that probably we have to work more together in the region uh, with the UN, with the governments, but also with uh, uh, both uh, regional uh, organizations such as ASEAN, as well as uh, the regional banks as the ADB, is really to uh, uh, work on uh, regional disaster and financial products. Um, and, and how those finance products are linked with the delivery program. So at the moment they are developing, in, in, not in autonomy, but are developed as a financial instrument without really looking at what are the need of the response program or the delivery program uh, to, be, to be more active. So uh, that kind of linkage, is, it goes back to the, con to the request of coordination we mentioned before. Then the idea of prevention and anticipation, it's, it's really a, a, a vast more interested aspect that we have to think about in terms of the response. So how much our response, so our engaging with beneficiaries into the, uh, the social protection system uh, can be a way to reduce their vulnerability and also to, to uh, uh, reducing the impact that uh, a specific shock may have on them and how we can look at those risks, how we can uh, uh, work on this in anticipation. Uh, we have seen more and more, for example, examples, and there is one in the Philippines where uh, the, uh, uh, there is a, a process to provide disbursement even few days before an, a big event, a big natural disaster can, uh, can happen in order to pay not ex post the, the justice support that 
the, the, the damage, but in a way provide uh, resources to limit the amount of damage. And the idea is that that kind of intervention may be more cost effective than actually giving the money later on. Uh, next one. So what uh, what I, I uh, we will work in at the moment together uh, with uh, WFP, the Red Cross, with the support of uh, ECHO, is this idea of scaling up social uh, uh, shock response and social protection system to proactively manage risk before, during, and after the impact. Uh, and this is uh, something that we are working uh, in uh, uh, a regional level and uh, uh, at a country level. And the idea is really to link with the early warning system and anticipatory actions. Uh, that's the probably the, the, the better way to link with the, uh, uh, with the risk financing mechanism to make sure that we can address multidimensional vulnerabilities. Uh, and this part of the early warning system is also the link with the climate data. As you can see, is really linking uh, the adult social protection that before was mainly working on the poverty component to more on the environment, on the early warning system and the climate data in order to connect anticipatory action with shock response and social protection. So really to see the cash as a possible way uh, uh, to uh, uh, reduce the humanitarian needs in the future and prevent the climate shocks from becoming a major humanitarian crisis. And that is probably the very interesting part of linking the two, the two components. Uh, and of course, uh, for that one, we need to strengthen government capacity, not because the capacity is not there, but because we, in this region, there is high capacity at individual ministry, at individual player. What we need is to make sure that each of the player, or the three player, we say, so the social protection, the public finance, the humanitarian response, do understand each other and are able to integrate together in order to take timely and risk informed decision. Next one. The, the activity, the, the, the future work, we will focus mainly on Cambodia, where we will link, want to uh, uh, work on linking the National Committee for Disaster Management and the Minister of Social Welfare, uh, Social Affair, as, as, as I mentioned before. And, uh, and in Indonesia, uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the possibility to uh, uh, work within the governments in developing tools to make timely and risk-informed decision, uh, with even a focus on local community and a local level of finance. So that's the uh, the work is uh, uh, ahead, and we hope to uh, to continue informing you on that. Uh, last slide. But uh, to to start triggering the uh, uh, the the also the discussion with as part of this uh, uh, initiative, we will have a uh, one regional component. So a component that goes beyond. Uh, we will involve all the ASEAN countries, and uh, and the idea is to make sure that. The integration uh, of anticipatory action and shock responses are developed and share. And as we heard at the beginning, is we have an early phase, but the experiences in the region are actually uh, uh, shared and, and in a way build on the shoulder of the other. So the idea is to look at how uh, quality forecast product and impact based analysis platform can be at regional level can be useful and can be used by different countries providing technical guidance or risk financing option for anticipatory action. Uh, and more importantly, creating a South-South cooperation uh, between the ASEAN. I think that there's a lot of interest, a lot of experiment, a lot of piloting, and a lot of new ideas. And this component of sharing will be a critical part of the future initiative. Next one, please. So to conclude, uh, what are the things that one of the points that we have learned, and I think is a very critical one, is this idea that DRF, linking DRF and, and shock response to social protection really requires solid evidence, research, and data. Knowledge is the critical aspect, more than what we thought in the past when we were developing a social protection system. And we need to have integrated data and management protocol so that the different aspects, the different players can work together using high quality and I would say quantitative and probabilistic risk assessments that should allow uh, uh, the policymaker to take uh, uh, decision about risk prioritization. Now, uh, for that one, it's important that any new initiative, and this is a call to everybody, that is designed has a, a key important research, research and evidence generation component to look at the impact to look at the efficiency and effectiveness of different options, 
just the example of before we mentioned before on the Philippines. So, for example, what is apart from the assumption of the hypothesis we have, what, what is the real economic value of giving, let's say, to make a, a very simplistic example, ten dollars the day or two days before a cyclone arrives, or giving ten dollars two days after the cyclone uh, arrives? What were the advantage and also the efficiency on that we can get if there was any? To answer this question, we need to design the intervention in a way that can give us solid evidence to the two. And that is important for this reason, that in a different uh, um, new intervention, new pilots, a component on a financial and I would say human brain component is, is linked to answer those impact questions. Next one. So I think there's a lot of areas of future research uh, there is definitely a lot of space to increase the uh, uh, the knowledge, uh, as well as to increase the experiences, as we, we heard, um, particularly look at different risk financing initiatives and different modalities. Um, Cecilia showed us a, a very interesting mapping of the options. Now we want to see what are the real options, what are the new ones. And for that one, we, we realized that the time for publishing a report is too long for the, all the new ideas and new and new models that are popping up. So. I think it's important to have kind of a, a real-time assessment of those. And I really hope that during the discussion, we can hear from you more, more, uh, more of that. Um, we want to leverage innovative and core functioning, financing for uh, shock response and social protection, for example, how we can do that. Uh, what are the benefits of delivery cash early and, I, uh, and, and others? Uh, our social protection system can work more closely with other shock response systems, for example, on the health response system. This has been... Uh, uh, um, a, a case, for example, of the COVID. And please uh, feel free to use any, uh, to use the Q&A to suggest any other further research or where we want to develop more uh, evidence. So without that, I will now, and we're a little late on that, we'd like to give to Dan, Daniel, if you're online, the possibility to, uh, to start a discussion, as a, as a discussion among all this, what you heard so far, and please keep using the Q&A and, and thanks, to, thanks to everybody who is answering the question over there. Daniel, over, you, over to you to start the discussion. Thank you, Andrea. I've um, put my glasses on to read the screen better and try and look a little smarter, but it's still me. Um, I'm going to um, thank, well, first of all, thank all the, the presenters for a lot of very rich um, material there and a lot of food for thought. I see there's a lot of questions in the chat. So I don't want to um, you know, prolong us getting to those questions and people coming in. Uh, I thought of uh, two or three questions to perhaps prompt discussion, which are sort of a broader, taking a broader view. So um, I'll throw those out there and uh, people can think about them uh, or just come in and pose any other question they would like to uh, the panelists or others online. So the first one, I guess, you know, we're the, the, the papers on Asia Pacific, and the, you know, myself and Andrea are based, and Davide are based in Asia Pacific, uh, Katerina as well. Um, and so, my first one is related to our region. You know, we are the most disaster prone region in the world. Um, we have a relatively advanced insurance and digital financial services architecture. Uh, many of the countries are emerging or emerged economies. But in disaster risk finance, this region is quite a way behind Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, for instance, in, in, in risk pools, but also in other risk financing instruments. So why is that? And what is holding the region back? That's question number one. Um, second question that comes to mind is that uh, a lot of di disaster risk financing discussions are focused on the financial instruments themselves. but as you've all rightly highlighted, there are, there's a lot to think about in terms of how you absorb money and get it out, how governments absorb and get money out to vulnerable people. Um, and there are very few links between disaster risk finance and social protection. Um, so the question is, um, from what participants in this uh, discussion are seeing at country level, what are the key areas that need to be strengthened in social protection systems? to enable the delivery of risk finance for shocks? And what are any particular challenges that, that are being faced, particularly at local level? And then my third question that comes to mind is a bit less 
about the technicalities and a bit more about politics. So we know that what so-called risk retention instruments, i.e. The, the instruments that governments use to address shocks after they've happened, are often very inefficient and damaging and disruptive, i.e. reallocating resources away from other programs towards disasters. Um, but disaster risk financing instruments uh, have their own prerequisites and requirements. And some of those are about make, making processes more open, accountable and objective. So instead of governments making a set of internal decisions about how to often reallocate funds for disasters, there has to be a bit more of an open common agreement, sometimes with third parties, such as the private sector, on how money will be used for which shocks and, and sometimes who will, will be reached. So my last question is, is that what governments want? Are the risk financing instruments currently on offer in their interest, in their perceived interest? Um, what evidence do they need to influence decision making and policy making? And what could development partners and donors be doing more of to better support and incentivize governments to adopt disaster risk financing? So um, with that, I'll hand things back over to you, I guess, Andrea, to moderate discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I would like to ask uh, Cecilia or Katrina if you would like to start uh, addressing one of those thought-provoking questions of, of, from Daniel. And please also, uh, anybody who would like to, to answer, to have an idea, uh, you can use for this one the chat so we can see your, your comments and a few lines uh, a possible answer to 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 Daniel's question, but first, Cecilia. Yeah, I can uh, I can attempt some answers to the second and the third question. I think I'll leave the question about the region to those that work in the region. But um, uh, I think in terms of um, you know the the, the financial instruments vis a vis the how you get the money out and where are the bottlenecks. Um, I think what we found, at least in this study, but also sort of looking at other at other regions as well, is that um, uh, the bottleneck seems to be in actually what you what you said in your third question is like you know putting in place sort of like going from that high level of oh we need this financing to like uh, the actual nitty gritty of the regulations and the plans and the strategies. And that is really challenging because, uh, first of all, it's not as sexy as like you know, like insurance and like all these like big instruments. And second of all, because it requires a lot of negotiation and collaboration, and mean you know, a, a just um, coming together at government level. And then of course you have the national level, and then you have the local level, which is also another layer of complexity, right? And where do you track the expenditure, and where you know how? So all these rules are very, very complex. So I think one of the things I really appreciated from working in this, uh, in this, um, in this task that we worked with UNICEF on, was to shed a light on the PFM aspects of all of this because they've they've been a bit forgotten. And I think uh, this is really an agenda that perhaps is not as, you know, as uh, glamorous, but it's really important. And I think uh, we need to follow up on that. And then on the on the politics, um, yeah, I think what we what we found is that yeah, governments use a lot of risk retention instruments, but we don't really know the and, and they use them exposed, right? So what you were saying that they're they're not the the most ideal way of financing disasters, but um, but we don't know the cost of it because there is so little like you know tracking, also so little kind of um, assessment of you know what is what is the real cost of responding like this so when you're taking funding from education or from health or from other sectors away to respond to shocks what does that mean you know and what 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 happens with those funds that are kind of taken away from from other sectors um but um i i thought i i think um i think we if we were able to sort of build more evidence and to know a bit more about that I think we could make a stronger case. I think governments are interested in kind of improving efficiencies of response, right? Um, so, but, but it's an area that we, we didn't find a lot on. So I'll, I'll stop there. 
Katarina, you want to maybe jump in on, on some of the question? If not, in the meantime, I can try to answer the first one, Daniel, that I think is a <laughs> quite provoking one. And it's valid for many things. Like um, the other one is if you just look at the level of evidence on social protection that we have in this region, is despite having middle income countries, a lot of resources, incredible programs, is much smaller than the evidence that we have in Latin America, and, the, and but even much smaller than the evidence we have from Africa, right? Uh, it's, 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 the, the, the gap is huge. Um, explanation of them, there are some simplistic one and other little more complicated. Probably the simplistic one is um, that uh, is the, the way how some of this uh, program has been structured, particularly with the donor support. When you have donor support, you have a stronger level of, of evidence request can be one uh, rather than by state where we have less uh, less you know, needs for external evaluation of internal impact assessment, etc. But I, I really don't buy it because uh, in Latin America, it was not donor driven, for example, and still we had very strong evidence uh, at the beginning of the uh, of, of the project. Maybe is uh, the way uh, some of those uh, intervention are created. Um, really, uh, I don't know, but I do think is is I agree with you is is strange. We do have experiences. We do have resources in terms of financing, but more important, we have intellectual capacity uh, uh, to develop uh, those kind of, both in terms of assessment of the impact of the different option, but also capacity to develop new kind of instruments. So that's a, a, a possible uh, possible honor to, to further investigate. But definitely, I think we have to send out the message that the level of evidence, documentation, resources is much smaller than the rest of uh, other countries in the world, including Africa. So that would be that would be one. Uh, that would be my first uh, comment. Um, any anybody else? Uh, and I think that's uh, uh, thank you, Davide. Thank you for uh, for the for the opening and for being with us during the during the webinar. Um, maybe uh, Cecilia, I've seen that you were. Uh, any 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 other? Well, maybe Daniel, do you have an answer to your question? That you always an option to, we should ask a discusser. What is your answer to your question? I was hoping you wouldn't ask that, but thanks, Andrea. So um, I guess uh, maybe um, thinking about the third question, I think we need to recognize definitely that more evidence needs to be built and we need to be um, asking a wider range of ministries which questions they need answering on this issue. So, you know, the Treasury, DRM, social welfare. Um, we need to recognize that some of the evidence that is built cannot be simply about comparing one system against another, because we're, we're often comparing apples and oranges and the costing of these things is, is ludicrously difficult. Um, moving away from evidence building, um, I think we have to recognize that there are high technical upfront costs, sunk costs, that not all governments can afford. And so this has to be a partnership also with international institutions and, um, and market-based institutions uh, from the get-go. So yeah, that's something that you need to bring a bunch of stakeholders around the table to, to think through. And also maybe talking a little bit more from the UN perspective, um, there are often um, risk financing products are linked to institutions with specific objectives. So sometimes it's quite hard for governments to know what is genuinely in their best interest and what is genuinely most appropriate for the so-called risk layering that they want to achieve. So I do feel that there is quite a bit of need for some sort of more neutral brokerage of the space um, to kind of say, what do you need? What are the instruments? What are their prerequisites? What's the technical capacity that you need in-house, not offered up by the provider of the instrument themselves, in-house capacity? And how can we help you come to some decisions about this that, um, that are more suitable for your context and your needs? Thank you so much, uh, uh, Daniel. And I, I think we are reaching exactly the last minute of this uh, webinar. 
I want to uh, thank you really a lot, uh, Cecilia, for being with us through all the process, not only for the webinar, but through all these uh, 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 months and and and, uh, and time for the work. It's a fascinating one. I want to thank you, Daniel, Katrina, for uh, for the presentation and Davide Eco for for all the support that we are receiving. It's really an area that we want to work more, but. Also, uh, all the colleagues uh, from uh, uh, from all uh, all the colleagues online, all the people in the ASEAN uh, that we have worked in this in this year. I think the ASEAN is definitely an area, uh, an institution that we can strengthen the collaboration. It has the power to bring what uh, uh, all the topics and the issues that Daniel and Cecilia were mentioning and uh, into at higher level and be discussed and being addressed. And finally, I want to thank uh, 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 all the socialprotection.org for hosting us and. Uh, I understand that will be uh, a survey that will pop up uh, uh, for uh, for the feedback. And I was told that uh, you will, all the people who just uh, will be receive a message with a link to um, all the materials or the presentations for sure, but also uh, the final publication that is coming as a Christmas present, as we really hope. So uh, again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, Paula, uh, let me know how it works for the survey, uh, and uh, uh, we are looking forward to get your comments and ideas. Please send us a message if you have uh, more interest on that. It was really a pleasure. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to all the colleagues in UNICEF, Jana, uh, uh, Jab, and Ruben for preparing all the material and all the work. Um, and see you to the next one on public finance and social protection. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.